I have the pleasure next of introducing our keynote, Tom Raybon from Red Hat. And Red Hat itself, I don't, I don't think, needs much introduction, and I'll do just a little bit on Tom here. Tom brings more than 25 years of experience working in government and the private sector to Red Hat's governmental affair and public policy initiatives. He worked extensively with government around the world to create market opportunities in places such as China and South America. One of the things he suggested I mention, and I think it's appropriate for this group, is he, he also served in the North Carolina State Legislature, which gives him some appreciation for government, for technology and government, uh, and I think it's some empathy for us as we try to deal with these issues. So if, if Tom doesn't mind, I'm going to go ahead and, and put him on right now without any further ado. Thank you. I'll give you Tom. Thank you very much, Kurt. And thank you, Deborah, for the invitation to, to be here um, with you this morning. Um, you know, there's really a lot of exciting things happening in open source, particularly as it relates to the global networked economy that we all live in today. And you're very fortunate in the state of Oregon to live in a state that obviously has an interest and an enthusiasm on the whole subject of open source. You've, you've got, right out the bat, you've got a congressman here who, first of all, although he doesn't admit it, I, we all know he really does understand open source. And if he's an IP lawyer, I'm sure that um, he has an even more interesting perspective uh, on open source. You've got a governor here who has, has been very enthusiastic as it relates to embracing ideas associated with open source. That's very helpful to what you're trying to do. You've got the open source development labs here that does wonderful things for uh, users of open source software, for the development community, and many others under the very capable leadership of Stuart Cohen and his team over there. You've got organizations like my friend LeVon Reimers who are doing things uh, in Oregon to try to create new open source companies here. A very fine thing to be doing. And finally, in Oregon, you've got what none of the rest of us have anywhere in the world. You've got the guy that started all of it as a resident of your state, Linus Torvalds. So what a portfolio. And I can tell you from, uh, I'm from North Carolina, in case any of you had not figured this out. I, I talked John Weathersby, who you're going to hear from later. Uh, he and I have made a pact. We'll translate for each other if there are any of you out there who can't understand what we're saying. <laughs> He's from Mississippi. <clears throat> but, but in any event, um, it, it, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity. My colleagues and I from Red Hat always welcome every chance to talk about this subject of new opportunities, because it's new opportunities in technology that re really created our company from day one. I'm also grateful to have the opportunity to visit with a number of leaders in the public sector, like yourselves. As Kurt mentioned earlier, uh, many years ago when I had hair and was a little taller, I was a state legislator. And so I, I understand that dynamic between uh, the legislature legislators who appropriate the money and folks like you who scratch their head and say, why'd they do that? Or why didn't they do enough? Uh, very interesting uh, topic. But you guys are really on the front lines out there. You're really pioneers when it comes to open source technology in government. Because you're really trying to find uh, innovative technology solutions to make government work faster and to be more responsive to the needs of your citizens. And together, we can improve government services by unleashing the full power of a global network technology. To do that, we need to remove anything and any obstacles which inhibit our ability to take full advantage of this global networked economy. I believe that the open source model of software will do just that. With open source and the open source model, companies do not wrap their software innovations in the cloak of proprietary or patent protection. 
Instead, they make their software code readily available to others under the appropriate copyright protections where the software can actually be built upon and be improved upon in an environment of collaboration, people working together. And fostering collaboration is a critical element in the open source software model. Linux, an open source operating system, was developed by Linus Torvalds while he was a young graduate student in Finland. And Linus actually shared his operating system with the rest of the world. And he did this over the World Wide Web. And if the World Wide Web had not been there, there may have been, never been a, a Linus Torvalds or maybe never even a, a Linux as we know it today. And his fellow programmers began adding to the code and sending uh, Linus modifications to the kernel. And that's really the way that open source software as we know it today, and certainly the Linux operating system, was born. So that today, we find ourselves in a situation where there are over 750,000 people all over the world. It could be a college student in Beijing. It could be a government employee in Brazil. It could be a, a college student right here in Portland, Oregon. Or it could be any of you who work in this every day. And you have the opportunity, as do people all over the world, to, to contribute to the improvement of the underlying code that runs the software. And this collaborative nature of open source software makes the technological advancements of the software happen even faster and more cost effectively while protecting the originator of the software innovation through copyright. Now, let's think for a moment about the common sense aspect of collaboration. No one person or one company, whether it be Red Hat or any other one, has a monopoly on all the good ideas out there, no matter what industry or what product we're talking about. A community of talented people melding their perspectives, their experiences, and their ideas together in a way that they can build upon one another's work will always, always make a much better product than any of us trying to do it alone. And that's the neat thing about open source software. You know, when I think about what's happening in open source, because it really is growing, and I'm going to share some of that with you here momentarily, but I was called by a reporter from Newsweek last week who's doing a big spread on the growth of open source. Um, you'll be seeing that within the next month or two. But in any event, she, she asked me, she said, what, what, what do you think the world of open source looks like? And I said, well, you know, I spent a number of years in the telecommunications business and worked for AT&T and a couple of other dinosaurs that are out there today. And what reminds, what's happening in open source reminds me of what happened in the telephony business when cell phones were on the horizon. There were a lot of folks out there who said, ah, it's too expensive, you know, this technology. You, are you kidding me? Put towers on, all over the place and, you know, you know uh, repeaters on buildings and that sort of thing. It'll never work. Now, who in this room doesn't have a cell phone in their pocket or a briefcase today? So as I look at open source, I see the same sort of phenomenon occurring. Take, for instance, the telephone network that we have in our country today. The, U the United States telephone network was actually built by a single large monopoly called AT&T and the Bell System during the first half of the 20th century. And by government decree, this monopoly alone was responsible for maintaining and upgrading the nation's telecommunications network. Now, while the telephone network was always reliable, that's one of the things that we prided ourselves compared to other countries around the world, it was also very slow to adopt new technologies because there was really no incentive to do it because they had a monopoly. And so as a result, uh, private entrepreneurs began to build data networks to accommodate the rising tide of computer traffic in the 1980s 
in the internet traffic in the 1990s. And it was only after AT&T and the Bell system was broken up that it really began to incorporate many of the changes need, needed to update the telephone network and to do so at a competitive pace. I use this example to make the point that in today's global networked economy, it can be and will be better served by an environment of collaboration, more so than one in which any single company dominates through monopolistic practices. Now, among the key players in building this momentum of open source are the governments of the world, people just like you. In many cases, governments have sort of a unique role. In some cases, government can be a policymaker, can do things to incent open source to grow. But the other interesting twist is government is a huge customer. Government is a huge IT customer huge uh, and a huge customer customer of open source as well and as more governments begin to understand the compelling benefits of open source software they become the driving forces in removing the impediments to its deployment for example in the last few months India's parliament struck down software patent legislation here several just last summer the EU Parliament voted down a directive to implement software patents. And as we speak, the US Congress is looking very seriously at significant patent reform in Washington, as our friend from Congress could tell us. This is very significant since some people and companies regularly abuse this patent system. They apply for and get the most simple uh, they, they apply for and get patents on the most simple of software upgrades. For instance, there's a, there's a company uh, north of here in Washington. I, somebody help me out there. Um, they have no, Boeing, right? No, that's not Boeing. That's a good guess. So. Um, they have 12 patents on the movement of a cursor. Now think about that. 12 patents on the movement of a cursor. That's really not what the patent system was meant to protect. And the end result is a monopolistic hold on software code and a stifling of innovation. Now imagine if one company had been able to patent and thereby keep secret the basic engineering concepts of putting up a building. How much longer and how much harder would it have been to realize the improvements in those building concepts that led to, to being able to build skyscrapers like the Empire State Building or the Petronas Towers where I visited in Malaysia several weeks ago, or even right here in Portland, the Wells Fargo Center. Governments around the globe want open source software so they can speed up technological development and technological advancement and the economic benefits that it brings. So as we look around the world, there is significant activity in the public policy re arena related to open source. Governments are getting more and more active in proposing open source based solutions because they believe it is a way for them to, number one, become more competitive in the marketplace worldwide, two, to be able to create their own indigenous software industry, Three, to be able to, to have a full, what in many parts of the world is called an in, informatization of their society, as particularly the case in India. And finally, to be able to reduce the, the cost of their IT purchases. And many countries are, are not too happy about the U.S. lead in the software industry. There's a lot of, uh, you know, anti-sentiment that gets caught up that sometimes reflected uh, in people's views on the private sector. And the software business is really no exception. <coughs> governments view open source as a way to compete. This is as foreign governments view open source as a way to compete in the software industry and also to ensure that their needs are met by their own software companies. India, for example, has numerous local dialects 
How many folks ever been to Indy before? Well, it, it's it's very different from Portland, Oregon. I can tell you that. And um, on my first visit there several years ago, I, um, the the leader of our business there, who's a, a young India Indian gentleman, on the way back to the airport, he said, he said, so Tom, after being in India for a week, what do you think? What do you think about our country? I said, well, you know, I'm just I'm just blown away. It's just it's very different from what I had it pictured to be, uh, and it's a, it's a country of dichotomies. I said, but I got to tell you, because it, this fellow lives in that, was born into that 1% of people in India who, who are sort of born into wealth and basically control the whole country. I said, but I got to tell you, when it comes to India, if I were you, I'd be worried there's, there, was, there could be an, a, a revolution here. He said, what do you mean? I said, well... You look around and you see this unbelievable poverty in this country. And for those of you who've been, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's just unbelievable, uh, particularly as it relates to, to children and the way children are treated uh, on the bottom rungs of the ladder. But I said, you know, in, in, a, in a society where you've got such a small percentage on top that controls everyone else, it seems to me that your country's ripe for revolution. He said, oh, no, no, that will never happen. I said, why? He said, because we speak anywhere from eight to ten different languages in India, and we could, we could never communicate with each other to have a revolution. So uh, India is one of those countries where dialects are a really big deal. And same thing in the software business. So with proprietary software, Indian citizens would have to wait for software vendors to create a version of the software in their own dialect. But with open source, India's citizens can assemble a team of developers and translate the software themselves. And that's why many governments are making decisions today about whether to require the consideration of open source or whether or not to reward some kind of a preference to it. In several countries, government procurement laws are based increasingly on economic development decisions. Country fa countries favor open source because they believe they can create jobs by developing native open source software companies, which will lead to cheaper cost and provide a more competitive response to the companies that promote proprietary software codes. Just in March, China released uh, a, a major domestic software procurement policy that granted a preference to domestically produced software only if it, were, uh, it, it was open source software. Now, while proprietary companies with a significant presence in China were excluded from this preference, open source was included. So it's really happening all over the world. In other countries, governments want open source to make technology much more accessible to their citizens. Some countries provide software directly to its citizens by developing their own open source distributions. Both China and Brazil have their own versions of Linux to distribute for negligible prices to their populations. The Indian government recently announced it was setting up an open source software center to develop free software for its people and also to help cut the price of personal computers. In Morocco, several agencies in the government use open source and have developed their own open source applications. Many governments also choose open source because they believe that it's more inexpensive than proprietary software. In May, the regional, one of the regional governments in Spain, of Valencia, announced that it would move to open source software because of its democratic duty as a public administration to save money on software. In August, the French region of Auvergne announced its plans to distribute 64,000 CDs packs with open source to secondary school students when the school year begins. Governments from Argentina to Vietnam have introduced over 125 open source policies into their public policy arena, either by executive order, uh, some sort of legislative action, by a man, some sort of a mandate from the CIO in that particular jurisdiction. And finally, and most powerful of all, the real 
force that's making things happen out there is a grassroots. It's people saying to their government, there's a better way to do this. And in many parts of the world, government is responding. There are over 160 local, regional, state, and federal governments around the world using open source software to run applications, entire agencies, and in some cases, entire governments. This is critical to the open source movement because the decisions made by these governments will influence the businesses and the, and the individuals who interact with those governments. In Brazil, for instance, open source is, is happening very quickly. At least five government ministries have moved to open source, and President Lula has plans to mandate open source in all of the federal government there. And he's providing incentives to regional and local governments to help them switch to open source. In Venezuela, President Chavez, on the 13th of July, signed a decree to all the federal government in Venezuela saying that within 90 days, I want a plan from you on how you're going to migrate your software from the proprietary world to the open source world. That's 26 ministries, 556 entities overall. And they have to have this migration plan by the end of October. In South Korea, the Ministry of Information and Communication said it'll provide a total of three billion won, that's a, almost three million dollars, for government agencies which want to use Linux and other open source computer programs this year. And in July, the same government announced that it would introduce a new education information system, an open source platform it developed on the Korean version of Linux, which, was, which is being planned to be rolled out to 10,000 schools and eventual plans to roll out to the, every school in the, in the country of Korea. And this is not limited, this open source growth is not limited to, to um, Latin America or to, um, to Asia. It's also happening in Europe. In March, Spain announced the creation of a national computer center for open source software to coordinate open source developments across administrative layers and across the country. Munich, Germany, Vienna, Austria, both of these cities are in the process of moving their operations to open source. In the UK, the government plans to fund an initiative known as the Open Source Academy to accelerate the use of open source in the, in the public sector. And in Norway, their IT minister just announced the country's plans to convert the entire public sector to open source software. And they'll have those migra migration plans in place by the beginning of 2006. Open source is also prominent down under in Australia, where the government actually released a guide to government agencies to assist them in moving to open source software, an e-government -govern initiative which they have there. And the theme of that e-government initiative is better services, better government. In fact, Australia's government chose not to mandate, not to mandate the use of open source in part because they were afraid that the demand would outstrip the industry's ability to supply that movement and that migration. And I can tell you from, I was down there last year in, in Sydney and in Brisbane and uh, New South Wales and in Canberra meeting with a number of government officials. Uh, they love open source in Australia and they're making some uh, major strides every single day moving in that direction. Just three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to um, visit Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And while I was there, I uh, went out to what's called the Multimedia Super Corridor in Kuala Lumpur. Very impressive. Uh, it, it, as Americans, uh, when, when you see that, it's a wake-up call for all of us. Malaysia, Malaysia actually created the Malaysian Public Sector Open Source Competency Center which I had an opportunity to, to visit. And part of, goodbye Congressman, thanks for coming. Thank they actually uh, created their own competency center there to help the public sector. And the open source competency center there will play an important role in ensuring and sustaining the growth of open source usage and development in the public sector. So what does all this really mean? 
And what does the future hold for open source software? Well, I think if the present is any indication, the future looks pretty bright to me. How many of you have read Tom Friedman's latest book, The, the, the World is Flat? If you remember, in that book, he, develop, he, he devotes a whole chapter to open source software. And he views this as one of what he calls the flatteners in the world to draw the world closer together. By the way, it, it, if, uh, it, if, if you hadn't read that book, you really need to do it. It is a great book. And, and it's, uh, I think every, if every American read what he had to say unrelated to open source, um, it, it's, a, it's another wake-up call for all of us. But what my company, Red Hat, and others are doing today in a collaborative spirit like the one that I described earlier is we're, we're helping to plant those seeds today in the open source world for a much wider use tomorrow. And this will allow customers, developers, and in your case, the citizens that the government serves everywhere to have many more choices as open source software becomes more widely available. So all in all, there's really no, no doubt in my mind that open source is a key factor in defining opportunity in the next generation of the global networked economy. And no doubt that governments play a huge role in that space. As I have the opportunity to, to work with a number of leaders all over the world in business, in government, and in education, I can tell you that there's no doubt in my mind what's happening with open source and the growth that we're going to see in the future. So I want to leave you with just a few final thoughts. I want you to, I want you to think back and do a little history here. Think back for a moment about the automobile. There were lots of people uh, a number of years ago before Henry Ford was around and even when he was in the idea stage who said there will never be a commercial market for automobiles. Think about it. I think everybody in this room has probably got an automobile today. There are many folks who said that man will never fly. And for sure, man will never, ever walk on the moon. We still got people in my part of the country that don't believe man's walked on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> And there are many people that said there'd never be a commercial market for computers. Now, where would the people in this room be today? Where would, where would I be if I didn't have the opportunity before I came over here to check in on my email, all that kind of stuff, before I ever left the hotel and get messages from all over the world? Things are changing out there. But because of people like you and like I, who are willing to take a chance, willing to stick our necks out just a little bit and embrace what we think is a new and promising and more cost-effective way in the technology sector. It's an opportunity for all of us to have a big impact on the playing field as we move forward. So finally, let me just say this to you, that if you ever visit uh, our headquarters of my company in Raleigh, North Carolina. When you walk in the door, the first thing you see is a prominent display, a, a quote from one of the great leaders of the world, Gandhi. And this is something that, that motivates each one of us as we walk in the door every single day. And really, the message there is no different from you and I and others in this room who would love to see open source software grow. And that's a message that Gandhi had. And it goes, first, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Thank you all very much. <laughs>